Thanks everyone for coming. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, so this talk is going to be about crypto analysis of uh, candidate branch and program obfuscations. And this is a joint work with Craig Gentry and Shai Halevi. Uh, 40 years ago, uh, Diffie Hellman made an announcement that we stand, uh, we stand today uh, on the brink of a revolution in cryptography. And four years ago, in the I.O. paper, the authors didn't say that we stand today on another brick of uh, stand the, on the brick of another revolution in cryptography, but uh, we feel like this is happening. So, with the power of I/O, as you can see from the several of the talks uh, the in this year crypt and in the previous years, you can build fancy applications, and I think more importantly, it starts, uh, it gives us a new way of thinking in cryptography. Uh, but uh, as the people who maybe only have the elliptic curve on your hand or like the uh, other tools and, uh, on your hand, you can still think, so what can uh, I.O. candidates be built up from? And uh, currently, we kind of only know how to build I.O. candidates from uh, candidate multilinear maps. And uh, the question is going to be recursively come back, say, uh, how much do we know about uh, the candidate multilinear maps and the I.O. candidates based on them? So, a brief history about the multilinear map and their relevance in cryptography. So, in 2003, uh, Bonnet and Silverberg gives us the motive of thinking about multilinear forms in cryptography. And also, they kind of envision uh, kind of there's maybe there are some possibilities to extend the wave patterns uh, in elliptic curve to make it to multilinear or higher degrees. And uh, Ten years later, uh, the candidates we have actually coming from a slightly different field, uh, which is uh, uh, there are three proposals we, uh, from, uh, I will just abbreviate in this talk as GGH13, uh, CLT13, and GGH15. So they are all based on uh, kind of the noisy based lattices based uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption idea, and they tailor the decryption method to support some uh, equality test in the highest level. So with these candidates, so four years later, how much do we know about these candidates? So kind of the, the status of the candidate multilinear map, if I summarize now, uh, there's something in the bottom that we still don't uh, well understood, which is even the one witness of the secrets in the encodings. So they might be secure, they may be hidden in some situations, they may not be hidden in some other situations. So we still don't have a, a general kind of methodology to understood how much they are hidden. And uh, so we don't have really good examples, but we usually take two benchmarks uh, of the applications that are built from multilinear maps. So one application will be the multi-party non-interactive key exchange, which sort of needs to use the public sampling mode of uh, multilinear maps. And the other benchmark is the uh, indistinguishability obfuscation, which do not need the public sampleable, motor, uh, public sampleable feature. And usually we try to analyze these two benchmarks to understand uh, how much do we understand about the underlying multilinear maps. So this is kind of the status before uh, this work. So we kind of like um, the power for zeronizing attack, kind of breaking the public mode, which is the key exchange application uh, for all the three candidates. Uh, and for I.O., we, uh, we actually don't know how to break all of them, and uh, we have some hope of security on uh, maybe some candidates. So for CLT13, the, the original uh, zeronizing attack, and you can uh, basically use that to break some branch and program of sketching based on the GGHRSW. For GGH13, uh, the work of Miles et al. can be used to, uh, they use the uh, uh, they can uh, break for some simpler variants of the obfuscati uh, obfuscation candidates that I will mention later. And for GGH15 based uh, uh, indistinguishability obfuscation candidate, uh, we didn't know uh, any uh, analysis result uh, before this work. So in this work, we basically show uh, new analysis results on the GGH13 based uh, uh, IO and the GGH15 based IO. So in a very high level, uh, uh, our new tag combines the zeronizing idea from uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the attack of Chong et al. two years ago, and we also uh, we also need to exploit uh, the weakness inside the obfuscation. Uh, 
So that's kind of the, uh, the core of our new attack. So I will mention it later. All right. So the plan of the rest of the talk is um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to review the GGHRSW obfuscation candidate, and uh, actually I'm going to spend most of the time to review that candidate because kind of uh, the core is to ex uh, extract the uh, the feature of that candidate, and then uh, kind of analyzing the candidates uh, on GGH 15 and 13 uh, is going to be following my explanations on that candidate. And I choose to kind of spend more time on GG15 because uh, that candidate spins, uh, seems to be less familiar with people. And in the end, I will briefly mention how it applies to GG13. So let me uh, review the candidate IO from uh, GGRSW. So uh, in my point of view, I kind of uh, uh, split the construction into a layer and a layer fashion. So let me explain what I mean. So to obfuscate a program, so any program is, uh, any obfuscation of a program is just uh, going to be another representation of the program. It's just uh, depending on the representation. So what do you do? Uh, so what, uh, what is done in the GG13 is actually, uh, I think of that in kind of four layers. So first, the zero layer, you think about it, you first choose a representation of the plain text expansion program. Then they add three safeguards or the uh, randomizing kind of pr process on the plain Platex pro uh, programs. And then in the end, they wrap the randomized uh, plain text program using the uh, multilinear, max, uh, multilinear maps uh, mechanism. So in some sense, the safeguards are the randomizing steps that uh, they sort of intuitively give more trouble and are preventing Ill illegal operations that I will also explain. And uh, the final multilinear map is sort of like we think about this is the source of uh, computational harness. So that's the big picture. So the truth of the plain text program chosen by uh, GGHRSW is uh, oblivious branching program. So basically, you can represent arbitrary circuits uh, by uh, uh, the subset products of uh, a lot of, uh, in a concrete term, the permutation matrices. So in this picture, these are all permutation matrices. So the, for the practical purpose for obfuscation, uh, we think about we have a functional branch where if you selected the input, so the input was selected the steps, uh, the first, for example, the first input will select the first step and the, the third step, second input for these. So for any inputs, the pattern will look like something like that. And uh, you do the product uh, of the selected matrix, you get either identity or non-identity cycle. So that will tell you 0 and 1. And actually, you always compare with a zero, uh, dummy branch. So in this picture, the dummy branch are all identity. So whatever you evaluate, you've got uh, identity. So you compare with these two, uh, and then you tell whether you're encoding uh, zero or not in this uh, branching program uh, representation. So let me describe the safeguards right now. So the first safeguard is called uh, killing randomization. So you basically pick a random random matrix and it's inverse and then multiply them in the middle of uh, each pair. So therefore, uh, it's kind of randomized each of them, but still when you evaluate, everything is going to be the same because the, uh, the K and the K inverse cancel out. And uh, then you do another kind of different pairs of uh, K prime in the branch, uh, dummy branch again. So the second uh, safeguard is called, uh, they call the bundling scalars to protect the mixed input attack. So what is mixed input attack? So observe the oblivious branching program to represent a circuit. So some input, uh, each input can actually manipulate uh, multiple steps. So in some sense, if I choose the first block in the first step and the second block in the second step, then you can actually compute something which you are not allowed to compute to. So the scalars, the random scalars A and uh, A prime they are chosen to, are trying to kind of uh, uh, enforce the consistency. So you must uh, choose the right scalars uh, and uh, in the functional branch and the dummy branch, and then you subtract them, they, they can cancel out. If you do it illegally, they won't cancel out. So you will get always uh, something you cannot recognize with. So I'm trying to, I'm going to remind you that actually the scalars are going to be the weakness uh, kind of exploit in this attack. So this is the right time to wake up. And uh, let me do the, the, this slide again. So observe what's the kind of the intuitive weakness of the scalars. 
So the scalars chosen by them are kind of, you need to have some uh, limited commutative, uh, commutative uh, uh, property. So in some sense, whatever commutative is better for uh, crypto analysis, it's easier to uh, extract with. So I will come to that point when we, uh, when we describe the attack. So the third safeguard is called uh, diagonal randomizations uh, on the diagonal entries on the, uh, the random entries on the uh, diagonals and the bookends. They put the bookends in the uh, on the on the two sides. So in this picture, it doesn't show anything. It just change the B and change the uh, the color. So let me do a s uh, zoom in. So in each block, uh, you don't represent the permutation branching program itself. Also, you pad uh, U and the V on the diagonal. Uh, these, these are random. And when you multiply together, these u and the v are going to be multiplied on the position of u and the v. So to cancel them out in the end, uh, what you do is you put the left bookend, which uh, is 0 on the first block, and uh, the right bookend, which is 0 on the second block, so that the functionality still works, and uh, it gives you more randomness. So this part don't have an intuitive uh, explanation of what, what it really uh, prevents, but somehow, in the previous attack by Miles et al. for Digital 13, kind of if your uh, obfuscation candidate don't have the random diagonal entries, uh, they can actually attack. But with the diagonal entries, they don't have the attack. So kind of uh, this um, intuitively creates more problem even in a very concrete sense. So that summarizes all the safeguards. And in the end, you just uh, you apply the multilinear map on whatever you have uh, got now, like the randomized the branching programs. So uh, this summarized the GGHISW candidate. And uh, in fact, uh, many of the branching program candidates, you can take an alternative view of these things as uh, having these components, maybe put them differently, maybe throw away some of them, maybe add something more, or maybe choose a different representations. So, and uh, there are other candidates based on circuit model, or they are bootstrapping from uh, functional encryption, or put them together. Uh, so these will not be covered by the talk today, but uh, I believe you can use the similar techniques to analyze yourselves. So, okay, so that summarized the description. And uh, if we take a more, uh, kind, kind of a more deep view on the difference of uh, other candidates, so the GGH ISW, the status is in the middle. If you use the candidates without the third safeguard, which is the diagonal entries, we know how to break them for GGH 13. Uh, GGH 15, we still don't know. And if you do it uh, kind of like even you, uh, you enforce the representation of the branching program to use the dual input branching program, that uh, fits into the right side. and. Uh, the, they even have a security analysis, the security proof in the idealized model for GGH 13. So this kind of gives you a more concrete view of uh, comparison with uh, simpler candidates and uh, even harder candidates. So our work, uh, our work is still focused in the middle, but uh, let, let me continue. So now let me move on to the GGH RSW if you uh, wrap the multilinear map with GGH 15. So let's see what happened. So still, brief r review of digit 15. So the digit 15, if I capture it concretely, it will still take another 25 minutes. So just uh, let me do a one-shot review. So remember, we are trying to wrap each of these square matrices randomized in the way that you can still multiply them and uh, do the zero test in the end. So what digit 15 do is, you think about uh, uh, each uh, slot of these square matrix you sample an LW encoding of that, then use the A matrices, which these are the digit 15 parameters. You sample a small, uh, small matrix encoding, so uh, a matrix which encodes as uh, these matrices are with small norms, but uh, these details are not, uh, uh, I think these details are two details for this talk. So these are uh, what the encodings look like. And the whole branching program, obfuscated branching program, let me give a big, uh, you a, a big view. So remember, there's a functional branch and there's a dummy branch. The encoded program is going to be look like this. So you will start with uh, the functional branches above, and each of them is encoding uh, each of the S. And uh, to evaluate, you just uh, compute A, D, 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 according to the input you are choosing. And then there's a dummy branch. You also uh, multiply accordingly. In the end, you subtract. 
So, okay. So let me describe the setting for the cryptanalysis now. So to attack Gigi15, we actually take well, four steps. But uh, before I tell you the four steps, let me tell you what kind of branching program we can break. So we are thinking for concrete examples, so you can extend them later, actually. So we are trying to distinguish program where all the branches are identity matrix. And uh, we are trying to dis uh, distinguish this with some other branching program Maybe the, uh, these two blocks of the branches are no identities. So they compute the same functionality, which is all identity, uh, but they are visually different uh, from this slide, at least. And uh, we are trying to break them after they are wrapped with all the safeguards and uh, GGG15. OK, so how do we do? So step one. So step one is kind of uh, easy. We first uh, honestly evaluate on uh, essentially all the inputs. And uh, we need to organize them uh, kind of smartly. So you think about, uh, we drop a line uh, on the branching program. So we uh, iterate uh, many inputs on the left and uh, iterate many inputs on the right and do the evaluation and the compute W equals to ADDDDD on the functional branch and the ADDD on the dummy branch and uh, subtract them as the honest evaluation. And we need to organize these matrices in a, a bigger square matrices, which uh, I will call it W. So why is that useful, we will uh, explain later. So you do a bunch of honest evaluations, and then we are going to play with uh, these evaluations. So the second step is we're going to compute the left kernel of that organized W. So after you have this W matrices, you can rewrite it, the expression into kind of the product of two sub-matrices. So the first one will be having uh, this S as a secret concatenate with uh, all the error matrices. And uh, the Z branch will be uh, uh, also what you can see from the Z branch. So the important uh, observation now is, uh, let's just uh, take a kind of a general view of both of them. So the Z branch is very likely, the Z box, you take it uh, as a square matrix, is very, very likely to be full rank uh, in, the basis, uh, in the base ring. So it's not any uh, multi-queue anywhere, it's in the base ring. So therefore, if you compute the left kernel of W, uh, it will be the left kernel of x, actually. So these two steps are kind of the standard uh, zeronizing attack by the previous work of Kohn et al. And then the next few steps is going to be uh, involving the uh, obfuscation uh, features. So step three and the step four are going to be uh, extracting the information about the scalars uh, from the left kernel. So this is actually a very complicated step, but uh, I kind of uh, summarized the result of analyzing this step. By the commutativity of the scalars, you can rewrite each uh, subset product of S in that way. So therefore, A can be pop out in the beginning. And uh, you just cut off all the randomized uh, uh, things. You can organize the equations about A's uh, in this way. So the F is the left kernel computed uh, in the previous step, and the A, the product of A, uh, in many kind of these samples are going to be the uh, uh, unknown variables that you're trying to solve. So this is what we have, and this is what we want. So the problem is, uh, this is kind of a bunch of nonlinear equations, and uh, you need to find a way to solve them. And uh, so it's actually like uh, we are using the homogeneous feature of these equations. So it's a tricky step, uh, that, uh, but uh, we guarantee after certain parameters, you can still kind of solve these equations and to get to the relations of these scalars. So, okay, so see, in some sense, if we get the relations of the scalar, we should already do the more, uh, kind of the mixed input attack because we kind of already take out one of the safeguards. And, uh, uh, but it turns out there are still more step we need to do, uh, which in this case, because we only get the ratios of the scalars, and these things are actually encoded in the ring of uh, cyclotomic integers. They are not in the ring of, um, it's not. It's it's in the fraction field of uh, uh, cyclotomic integers. So what we have is the ratios, and what we want is each of them. So in some sense, uh, in the last step, we use a huge hammer that if you have the uh, principal ideal uh, program, uh, principal principal ideal problem solver, and the fractal oracles, then we can actually get some of these uh, scalars. So. If you want to build a quantum computer or willing to spend uh, some exponential time on your own, please try to uh, build a principal ideal solver and the fractal oracles. 
So to summarize, after these four steps, and uh, in, the, in the last step, using some superior power, you can extract the scalars and the conduct the, the mixed input attack. So GG13 is very simple. Uh, uh, what you do is actually, uh, so I will skip the GG13 recap. The feature is all, uh, also the similar things. You get the ratio of the scalars, and then try to do the kind of the, uh, use the simplified annihilation attack to extract, uh, to do the mixed input attack in the middle zone. So I will skip the details. So to summarize, this is the status, and uh, kind of like I put something in the middle now. So this is the GG13, uh, sorry, this is the GG RSW uh, status. And this is the concurrent work which uh, they are uh, uh, online uh, concurrent with our proposal. And I think still using all of these te uh, techniques, breaking branch and program candidates with dual input uh, uh, protection and with all the safeguards is still uh, difficult. So these are the summarizing of the status and um, these are the direction for the new crypto analysis if you want to try. And also uh, we have some positive, so for counter crypto analysis, uh, you can also uh, for limited use of GTH15, we already know something can be proved based on uh, LWE. So all of these stories are kind of the ongoing story of pursuing the truth and happiness in the crusade of postmodern uh, cryptography. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk and thanks for your time.